Lord, truly that is our prayer. That our hearts would be filled with your praises. And that these praises would burst from our lips and from our lives. If we did not praise you, surely the rocks would cry out. We who are made in your image have rebelled against you as a race. And you are a God of grace and mercy. And unlike the fallen angels who are irrecoverable, you have extended kindness to those made in your image. We have taken the things that belonged to you and we have squandered them. We have perverted them. We have used them for self-aggrandizement and false hopes of fulfillment. We have surely worshipped and created, uh, worshipped the created thing rather than the creator. And you, Lord, are to be forever praised. And so we pray that the words of our lips, that the actions of our lives, the motives of our hearts, would cry out with what you are due. Total, all-out devotion. God, as we come to your word this morning, we pray for help. We know that the things that your word calls us to are beyond us. We do not have in and of ourselves the ability to accomplish, to do what your word demands. And yet you provide strength. You provide good works and cause us to walk in them. You are the source of all good things, the sustainer of any good in us. And so, God, we ask for your help. We need you. Use your word in our lives this morning in ways we couldn't plan or prepare for. Would you see fit by your Holy Spirit to wield your holy word in the lives of your set-apart people and all for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're continuing our series entitled, Seeing with the Eyes of Heaven. And I'm going to read for us beginning in chapter 4, verse 16, up through the verses we'll look at this morning. Hear the words of God through the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, beginning in chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, and the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from this body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what has been done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us, so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearances and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. 
having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, verse 16, from now on we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we no longer see him this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. This section of Scripture, such a pivotal, critical section of our Bibles, gives us an eternal perspective. It helps us to see from the lens of eternity, perhaps from the eyes of heaven. And we've learned to rethink our afflictions, our afflictions, to see them as light and momentary. We've learned to think about our home as heaven our goal as pleasing Christ, our motivation, fear and love, fear of the Lord and love of Christ. And if we think through this section of scripture through seven words, afflictions, home, goal, motivation, we come today to our fifth label, our fifth word to guide us through this passage, people. How shall we view people? If I were to ask you this morning to describe someone that you know, what would come to your mind? Perhaps physical appearance, height, hair color, age, you can approximate that, their clothing, their ethnicity. Maybe you would think of non-physical descriptors, where they work or live, their favorite sports team or recreation, what kind of music they listen to, what food they eat, who they hang out with, their hobbies. And the world loves to divide people. And the world has various categories for thinking about where people belong, slotting them into various segments. And our culture today is perhaps more divided than it has been in a long time. We are divided by language and ethnic background, country of origin, social standing, class, the haves and the have-nots, oppressors and the oppressed, educated and uneducated, first, second, third world, the rich, the poor, the pessimists, and the realists. The pessimists call the realists optimists. The tall and the not so tall. But there are truly only two kinds of people in this world. And you remember the infinite ball of twine that depicts your life. That ball of twine could be wrapped around this room a dozen times and thrown out the front doors and wrapped around the earth a dozen more times and sent to the moon and back a hundred times and out into interstellar space. And it would not yet represent the duration of your life. And the millimeter at the front end of that infinite ball of twine is your life on this earth. How will we see humanity through the lens of eternity? There is only one dividing line between two fundamental groups of humans. And all of us, by the way, were born on one side of that line. That line separates the forgiven from the unforgiven. All are sinners. All have fallen short of the glory of God. But there are those whose sins have been forgiven once and for all time. And there are those whose sins have not been forgiven. That line separates the ungodly declared righteous by grace through faith from the ungodly left to themselves and their own devices. That line separates those born from above and all the ones still dead in trespasses and sins. That line divides those who have experienced the transforming love of God through Christ and those who have not. Those are truly the only two groups. Those are the only two groups in all of eternity. And I want to encourage us this morning to get a 10 trillion year view of people. How does an eternal perspective govern the way we think about all people everywhere? And we'll think about that in three categories. All people generally, and then Christ specifically, and Christians or those in Christ. Let's read again 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17. 
Therefore, Paul writes, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. The new things have come. First, how does an eternal perspective govern our view of all people? Notice the first part of verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. This therefore draws a conclusion from what has gone before. A significant conclusion from what we looked at two weeks ago. We saw in verses 14 and 15 that Christians are those who have died They have died and they now live. And they live not for themselves, but they live for him who died and rose again on their behalf. You remember that new birth brings about the death of the old man and the entrance of eternal life. To be born again is to say what Paul said in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. A Christian, by definition, is a person who died at at new birth and now possesses eternal life, eternal life that will transcend your earthly mortality. When you were first born on this earth, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to walk. When you were born again, you were born again unto spiritual life. John 5, 24, Jesus said, anyone who believes in him has passed out of death into life. If you are not yet born again, you are, as John Wayne said, walking around but dead as a beaver hat. But if you are alive in Christ, you possess that well of life flowing up by the Spirit of God, That never ends. And so this reality leads Paul to a broad conclusion, a conclusion that encompasses everyone on this earth. As Christians, we can never look at people the same way again. We must begin to see everyone around us from this 10 trillion year perspective. How will we look back on humanity 10 trillion years from now? That is the perspective we must try to get here. And it is a perspective not built on outward appearances. Notice what Paul says. From now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. That is, by fleshly standards. This according to is a a word about standards. It is the standard of external or temporary or visible metrics. We don't look at people that way. Paul told the Corinthian believers in 2 Corinthians 10, 7, you are looking at things outwardly. That was an indictment. It was one of their fundamental problems. They were were tempted over and over again to assess things by fleshly standards, by outward appearances, by the standard of what could be perceived by a mere temporal consideration. But having an eternal perspective means we begin to view all people according to the standard that eternity demands. And eternity divides humanity. Not along the lines that we typically divide people. It is helpful for my own heart to fast forward the story. To think about people through the lens of what they will be 10 trillion years from now. C.S. Lewis captured this thought in his essay, The Weight of Glory. Some of you perhaps have read it. I'll quote him at length here. Lewis wrote, it is hardly possible for us to think too often or too deeply about the glory of our neighbor. The load or weight or burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid daily on my back, a load so heavy that only humility can carry it, and the backs of the proud will be broken. It is a serious thing to live in a society of eternal beings. To remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. Or else, a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we, in some degree, are helping each other to one or other of these two destinations. 
It is in light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with the awe and circumspection proper to them that we should all conduct our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilization, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. They are immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. This does not mean that we are to be perpetually solemn. We must play, but our merriment must be of that kind, and it is in fact the merriest kind, which exists between people who have, from the outset, taken each other seriously. No flippancy, no superiority, no presumption. And our love must be real and costly love, with deep feeling for the sins, in spite of which we love the sinner. No mere tolerance or indulgence which parodies love as flippancy parodies merriment, end quote. Think about large gatherings, been at a college football game, being in a traffic jam, and considering all the destinies of humanity before you. Think about the people that you know, teachers, students, family members, neighbors, coaches, teammates, employers, colleagues, employees. Do you see them through the lens of eternity? Do you see them with heaven's eyes? This passage demands that we begin to do so. The 10 trillion year view of people caused Paul to think of everyone differently. And most pointedly, Paul was caused to view Jesus Christ with new eyes. Notice, secondly, in the second half of verse 16, Paul's view of Christ. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. This is autobiographical for Paul. He marks a radical change in his own life of his view of the person of Jesus from Nazareth. Turn to Acts chapter 9. You are perhaps familiar with this radical transformation. Paul was a Pharisee, uh, elite sect of Jewish teachers in his day. He was well trained in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament. He was committed to the reality of there being only one God. And should anyone step up and claim to be God, such a one would be a blasphemer. Paul was trained in the Old Testament expectations of Messiah And surely one hung on a tree was cursed of the Lord, not the anointed one. Surely one who was beaten down by the Romans, surely one who could be strung up by a riotous mob could be no Messiah. All of this changed for Paul as he was on his way to persecute the followers of Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 9. Follow along as I read verse 1. Now Saul, that was his name prior to being renamed Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord Jesus. He went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and it will be told you what you must do. And the men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. 
Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Look down at verse 18. Ananias, a man, had been sent to speak to Paul. Verse 18, immediately there fell from Paul's eyes something like scales. He regained his sight. He got up, and he was baptized. A public profession of faith in this Christ. He took food and was strengthened. Now for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, he is the son of God. And all those hearing him continued to be amazed. And they were saying, is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? Paul's perspective of Christ was radically altered by Christ. I don't know what you thought of Jesus before you believed in Jesus. If you are a Christian here this morning, you may have thought him as boring. You may have thought of him as interesting. You may have seen him as an accessory to your otherwise self-satisfied life. Paul saw Jesus as a mere man. And a mere man making such audacious claims as the ability to forgive sins. Making the claim that he was, in fact, God in the flesh. This was Yahweh in human flesh. Of course, such a mere man making such a claim would be a false messiah, a blasphemer, a phony. And anyone who followed such a pretender was worthy of imprisonment and death in Saul's mind. And so Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 5 that he had known Christ according to the flesh. Jesus of Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Wrong side of the tracks, born in scandal. Weak, foolish, a blasphemer. Maybe you're here this morning and you still see Jesus as Paul once did. This change in perspective for Paul about Christ changes everything about Paul's life. Why? Because if Jesus of Nazareth was truly the son of God, he was truly the Messiah, the son of David, the expected one, the anointed one. He was the word made flesh. If that's true of Jesus. And he walked out of his own tomb by his own power, laying his life down and taking it up again. Then he is the conqueror of death, truly the one able to forgive sins. The only one able to assuage the wrath of almighty God so that sinners who believe in him could be declared righteous. Well, that changes everything. This Jesus must be followed. This Jesus must be worshipped. This Jesus must be obeyed and loved and adored. For me to live is Christ, Paul would go on to say. My life is Christ, Paul would say. Nothing worth holding on to instead of Christ And there's no neutral ground with Jesus. You you just can't sort of like him. You can't believe he was a good guy, a good teacher, a moral example, a, a revolutionary or a martyr hero. He is God's son with the fullness of divinity who became man so that he could die on a cross in the place of sinners. Or he is a fraud worthy of no one's respect. And you can't just add a little Jesus to your otherwise self-centered temporary existence. As if to make life just a little more tolerable if you have some good feelings about Jesus as you carry about your business. Knowing Christ is an all or nothing enterprise. To believe in him is to cast your life on him. To entrust yourself fully and wholly to him. And what a good life that is. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Another autobiographical section 
where Paul is describing this transformative view of Christ that changes everything. You get the impression when you read the Apostle Paul that he just never got over this unbelievable grace of God that would take one such as himself and make him a trophy of grace and allow Paul to know God through Christ. What a privilege. Paul says in Philippians 3 and verse 7, whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ, so that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my, righteousness of my own derived from the law, but a righteousness that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. It's all worth it. We're going to pick up this theme from Philippians 3 tonight in our evening service Paul's point here in 2 Corinthians 5 is that we no longer judge according to outward appearances, but now we see Christ through heaven's eyes. And think about this, not just Jesus, the baby son of Mary, and as was supposed, the son of Joseph, not the sweet, gentle Jesus of the liberal theologians. Certainly the Jesus portrayed in the Gospels, but we fast forward to get a fuller picture. Fast forward to Revelation chapter 1, when the Apostle John saw the glorified Christ and fell on his face as a dead man before him, whose eyes flamed like fire and whose, the sound of whose voice was like the sound of many waters, who holds the churches in his hand. We can rewind the tape and, and look at Isaiah's experience. And we know from John chapter 12 that in Isaiah's vision in Isaiah 6, he was seeing the Lord Jesus Christ prior to his birth. And he cried out, uh, the, the, the seraphim there cried out, holy, holy, holy is Yahweh, the Lord God of armies. And Isaiah said he saw the king in his glory, and he fell down like a dead man before him. Think about Matthew 17, Peter, James, and John taken up on the mountain. And they're able there to see Jesus during his earthly ministry with the earthly tabernacle pulled back just a bit, and Jesus radiating glory uncloaked for a few moments. And this terrifying, glorious vision of Christ is simultaneously attractive. Can we stay here? Can we build tents here? It's this awful beauty you just don't want to leave. This terror that is terrific. It draws you close and makes you want to be there. And you realize you're in the presence of infinite beauty, and a gravitational pull that says it is good to be in the house of the Lord. I would love to be a doorkeeper on the edges than to enjoy anything else out there in the tents of the wicked. And think about Revelation chapter 5. There you have concentric circles of worship surrounding the lamb slain who is simultaneously the lion of the tribe of Judah and the songs are sung and there is the voice of many angels around the throne, Revelation 5.11. And living creatures, those fiery ones from Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel chapter 1 still crying out the same song they were singing thousands of years ago. And the 24 elders. 
And the number of the angels, uh, worshipers, myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, all crying out with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in him, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. And no one is to be worshiped, but God alone. And this exalted view of the glory of Christ ought to govern our thoughts. When we think of Jesus, we think of Him. This changes our view of humility, doesn't it? That that glorious and exalted one took on flesh and became a servant. This is absorbing compelling, consuming. To see Christ through heaven's eyes is to see all of those who are in Christ in a new light too. This is our third point this morning. What is the 10 trillion year view of a Christian? A little Christ. You belong to him? You belong to that one? That that glorious, exalted one that the 24 heavenly elders fall down before and worship, that the four living creatures who have never sinned cover their faces and their feet and they hover over holy ground and they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. You belong to that one in the center. He's called you his own. He's brought you into his circle. He has called you brother fellow heir and friend, and yes, slave and loved Christian. What privilege to belong to Christ. So we view Christians differently now. Look what Paul says in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. New things have come. The therefore here gives us another conclusion built on what has just been declared. This heavenly perspective on Christ leads to a new perspective on all those who are in Christ. And here believers are called a new creation. New here is something previously unknown. It is that here which replaces the old. As in the old is obsolete, the old is replaced. The same word for new is used of the new covenant that made the old covenant obsolete. It's used of the new heavens and new earth. The old universe will be done away. According to Revelation 20, it will flee away like a fugitive. This word is used for the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven in Revelation 21. And in Revelation 21, 5, when Jesus is to make all things new, that is the old order of things does not come back. So too, a Christian is a new creature. The old is gone. The new has come. The old man, the old creature never returns. A Christian is a new creature. And this is a remarkable picture. It tells us much about the Christian life. The Christian life is not a slow slide into self-improvement. You know, I just need to clean things up a little bit. Maybe add a little bit of Jesus. Uh, You go to church, kind of fit in with the churchy people. That is not the Christian life. This is where religion gets it all very wrong. Every religion is invented by man and every man invented system of appropriating God is a system of self-improvement. Oh, oh, I might give lip service to faith, but that, that faith is that God has given me the opportunity and the ability to sort of clean myself up and to do better, try harder, to, to make my way, to, 
to do the things that God will reward. And, and hopefully, if I've done it well, done it right, I, I can meet his standard. I, I don't really want to think about what his standard is. I have to lower it to make it achievable. That's all human religion. Christian life is totally different than all of that. And I don't care what label you put on it from any part of the world. Biblical Christianity is a radical transformation wrought by God alone in the heart. And he does it through faith. Not by works. No one's going to boast. I got in because I, that's religion. And nobody with that line gets in. Faith alone, in Christ alone, and even that faith is wrought of God in the new birth. Becoming a Christian is a radical transformation. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. I love telling people on their birthdays, thank you for being born. What's the response? Well, I didn't have much to do with that. Oh, and thanks for being born again. Oh, that's why Jesus used that illustration. God does a work such that one who has faith is born from above. Look, and if God new births you, nobody can undo that remarkable work. Who does the creating here in the new creature? Is it you? No, of course not. Implied in this title for a Christian, new creation, is the identity and power of the creator. He called all things out of nothing back at the beginning, and he calls spiritual life out of nothing at the beginning of faith. And what comes with this? What is this new creature like? Well, this new creature has new desires, new affections, new power, new purpose, new identity. And this is a strange creature, I confess. It's a mixed up creature because until this new creature is glorified, there is still the residue of total depravity. Universal depravity means everybody sins. Total depravity means sin affects every part of the human constitution. Minds, thoughts, will, actions, presuppositions, all of it were infected through and through. The believer is not released from the totality of depravity. Meaning, sin still affects the new creature life at the thought level, at the motive level, at the heart level, but it is the residue of a slavery to sin from which we have been radically and totally amputated. The Christian is no longer under the dominion of sin. And so the Christian as a new creature has new powers, new abilities, not available, not accessible before when you were dead in your transgressions and and, and sins. You are alive in Christ, Christian. That is what's new. And what's coming still yet is the total eradication, not just of the power of sin or the penalty of sin. Those are done for the Christian, but even one day the very presence of sin in our lives will be removed. Consider the before and after. And maybe you've thought through this as as you've shared your own testimony with others. Hey, I got to tell you what I used to be like. Can I tell you what Jesus has done for me? That's a great way to share the gospel with people. Think about Ephesians 2, dead. What can a spiritually dead person do? Spiritually speaking, nothing. Totally unable to please God, unable to understand spiritual things. They're spiritually appraised. You were dead. As dead, as dead spiritually as Lazarus was dead physically four days in his own tomb. Think about Romans 5, you were enemies of God under the dominating reign of sin and the tyranny of death. 2 Corinthians 4.4, you were under the blinding influence and corruption of Satan himself. You were an active participant in the world system opposed to God. You were a slave of darkness. You were unfit for heaven with no hope of improvement, no remedy for the sickness, no emancipation from the slavery. But God... 
Don't you love that contrast in Ephesians 2? But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Think about what it means to be a Christian. You are the called of Jesus Christ. Credited with righteousness, blessed, forgiven, an inheritor of the world, justified, at peace with God, saved from wrath, reconciled, under the reign of grace, joined to Christ's death, a partaker of Christ's resurrection life. You are not your old self. You're free from the mastery of sin. You are a slave of righteousness, a slave of God. You are uncondemnable. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, a son or a daughter of God, adopted, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. You are glory concealed. You are foreknown, predestined, predestined for Christ's likeness, Called, justified, glorified. You are God's elect. You are interceded for by Christ. You are inseparable from the love of God. You are overwhelming conquerors. You are the people of God. You are the body of Christ and members of one another. You are set apart in Christ Jesus. You are saints by calling. You are spiritual people. You have the mind of Christ. You are God's field and his building. You are the temple of God. You are washed, set apart unto God. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are bought with a price. You are brothers and sisters to each other. You are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, made to drink of one spirit. You are placed by God in the body just as he desired. You are destined for glorious physical resurrection. You are not yet home. You are a new creation. You walk in flesh, but not according to the flesh. You have been crucified with Christ. You are blessed. You are redeemed from the curse of the law. Baptized into Christ. Clothed with Christ. You are one in Christ Jesus. Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. You know God personally. And you are known by God. You are waiting. You are led by the Spirit. You're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You are chosen before the foundation of the world. You are predestined to adoption as sons. You are lavished in the riches of God's grace. You are God's inheritance. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You are God's possession. You are for God's praise. You are loved greatly by God. You are made alive and saved by grace. You are raised up with Jesus, seated with him in heavenly places. You are God's workmanship and you are created to walk in the good works God prepared for you. You have been brought near to God by the blood of Christ. And we together are one new man in him. Together, we have access through Jesus in the Holy Spirit to the Father. We are fellow citizens of God's household. We are a dwelling of God in the Spirit. We are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of promise. We are members of one another, beloved children. We are light in the Lord. We are filled with the, spirit, with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus. We are those in whom God is at work to please Him. We are citizens of heaven. We are waiting for Jesus' return. We are qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. We are rescued from darkness, transferred to the kingdom of Jesus. We are reconciled to God to be presented before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. We have been buried with Jesus and raised up with Jesus. We have been made alive with him and forgiven. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We are insiders to God's plan and purpose. We are called unto God's glory and kingdom. We are sons of light and sons of the day. We are destined for salvation. 
We are a people for God's own possession, saved by God's mercy, washed in regeneration, renewed by the Holy Spirit, justified by His grace, made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We are called brothers to Jesus. We are free from the slavery of fear and the slavery of death. We are partakers of a heavenly calling, partakers of Christ. We are represented by Jesus. We have consciences cleansed from dead works to serve God. We are forever set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus. We are being sanctified. We are being, we will be perfected forever. We have confident access to God through Jesus. We have our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. We are enlightened. We are partakers of divine discipline. We are the fruits, first fruits among God's creatures. We have been chosen to obey Jesus according to the foreknowledge of God by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. We have been chosen to be sprinkled with Jesus' blood. We are born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. We are possessors of an imperishable, undefiled, unfading, guarded inheritance. We are protected by God through faith. We are lovers of Jesus, believers in Jesus. We are those who rejoice with great joy in salvation. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus, born again through the living word of God. We have tasted of the kindness of the Lord. We are living stones in a spiritual house. We are a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are receivers of mercy. We are aliens and strangers in this world. We are called to suffer injustice. We are healed of the mortal sickness of sin. We are heirs of the grace of life. We are those who do not return evil for evil. We are the flock of God, cared for by God. We are an enemy to Satan. We are called to God's eternal glory in Christ. We are receivers of faith. We have been granted everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of God. We are partakers of the divine nature. We have escaped the corruption of the world. We are those who long for a new heavens and a new earth. We are in fellowship with God. We are in fellowship with one another. We are keepers of God's word, lovers of the brothers, abiding in the light. Our sins have been forgiven. We are overcomers of the evil one. We are strong with the word of God abiding in us. We are alive forever now. We are anointed by the Holy One. We are knowers of the truth. We are confessors of Jesus and of the Father. We are those who abide in Jesus and in the Father. We are taught by God. We are born of God and practicing righteousness. We are unknown by the world. We are not yet as we will appear. We are hated by the world. We have passed out of death into life. We are overcomers of the Antichrists, plural in this world. We are those who love the children of God. We are those who keep God's commandments. We are those who overcome the world. We are the ones who have Jesus and possess eternal life. We are kept by God. We are protected from the evil one. We abide in the teaching. We do good. We are beloved in God the Father, kept for Jesus Christ, kept in the love of God, and we are preserved to stand in God's presence blameless with great joy. Four and a half pages, single spaced of identity statements, realities of what it means to be a Christian. And my friends, that's only from the book of Romans through the book of Jude. (laughs) What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to look at Christians as we ought. It is to acknowledge all of these truths. What does it mean for how we think about humanity? There are some implications we need to consider. There is only one race, the human race, We are all descendants, direct descendants of eight people preserved by God's mercy floating in a box on the floodwaters that destroyed the pre-flood world. We are all direct descendants of Adam and Eve. We are all of the same race. And the things that the world would divide us by 
must not divide those in the church. We are in Christ. And think about this, Christian. No matter what you eat, no matter what you wear, no matter what kind of music you listen to, no matter who your friends are, what language you speak, or the amount of melanin in your skin, you have far more in common with a tribal mountain people in Papua New Guinea who believe the gospel, whose clothes you wouldn't wear, whose food you wouldn't eat, whose houses you wouldn't live in, than you have in common with people in your neighborhood that look like you, talk like you, recreate like you. You see, this dividing line cuts families, the forgiven and the unforgiven. The dividing line cuts cultures and languages, and yet it unites all languages and peoples and tribes and tongues around the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, who purchased people for his own possession from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. Think about unity and division for a moment. We don't have real unity with unbelievers. Skip down the page in 2 Corinthians to chapter 6 and verse 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. That's the command. Right? The, the, perhaps the immediate application that comes to your life is don't marry a non-Christian. Therefore, I probably shouldn't date a non-Christian. Therefore, I probably shouldn't be attracted to a non-Christian so as to date, so as to marry. That's, that's a good application. It's not the fundamental implication of this text. The, the implications of this text have, have a lot to do with how we traipse through this temporary existence. Will you be yoked together with someone going a different direction for a different purpose? This is why the church can't marry the world to try to accomplish the glory of God in this life. The church can't be bound together with the way of the world of doing things in hopes that God would be pleased and the gospel would spread. There is a fundamental dividing line, a fundamental disunity between those who have Christ and those who live according to Belial, as Paul says. What do they have in common? What, what fellowship, what partnership, righteousness and lawlessness, light with darkness, Christ with Belial, believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? There's some serious applications for, for how we think about going about our business in this world. And particularly, I mean our business of being ambassadors and heralds of truth and the gospel. We do have a true and lasting unity with every single blood-bought believer. Every one. We will dwell in the kingdom of Messiah and in the new heavens and new earth with our blood-bought kin, a family, a family comprised from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. We get a glimpse of that in the church in the present age, though an imperfect glimpse. And while convictional differences and theological differences must necessarily keep us from locking arms in some ways for labor in this life, I believe that. We must never lose sight of the reality that all of our differences will evaporate in Jesus' presence. All of our theological errors, praise God, will be wiped away. All of our errant perspectives, all of our faulty hermeneutical conclusions, our sins, our slights, offenses given and offenses taken, they will all dissolve in the brilliant freedom of the glory of the children of God. They will be enveloped in eternal love and sinless perfection in the presence of our common Savior, the incomparably glorious triune God. That'll be a good day. Think about that, Christian, when you're around other Christians with other perspectives. If they are blood-bought, their home is your home. They are your family. And we grant there are theological differences that come out of conviction from Christians aiming to be obedient to God's word. The standard is not what are other Christians doing? 
the standard, the metric for how we live, how we do church, how you live the Christian life, for everything pertaining to life and to godliness is right here in God's word. And we get tangled up when we live by peer pressure and, and think about what all the other Christians are doing or what the latest trends are, the latest books and those things. Make your life, make your ministry centered around the word of God. If you run hard after Christ according to his word, there will be sweet times in this life where your pace and your direction matches somebody else running the same direction at the same pace. And you go, hey, you're following the same thing. And our unity is around the word of God, not at trying to find compromise with each other. Because my errors compromised with your errors isn't going to lead me to truth. Like the truth is 50-50 between our errors. No, our, our real unity is as we get closer and closer in this present age to the truth of the word of God, we will find ourselves closer and closer to each other. So there's a real unity available in the church. And by the way, the, the tighter the relationship, the more yoke fellow you are with other believers, the tighter that convictional unity must be. Right? You think about that when you're choosing a spouse. Uh, if you're on... Totally different theological worldviews. Blood-bought though you may be, it's going to be hard to run together. Uh, this becomes important when you think about ministries to work with, missionaries to partner with on a team. Uh, lots of implications of what it means to seek unity around the Word of God together. But know this, Christian, all of those disparities between our views will be wiped away in an instant when we are with Him. By the way, there will be no theological debates in heaven. There will be no evangelism in heaven. Hey, I think you need to know, hey, down in front, I know him already. There will be no preaching in heaven. Look, if I'm standing up in front of you at the, around the throne room of Christ in the concentric circles of worship, just, just say, sit down. We're looking at him. That'll be a glorious day. I want to think about another implication with you this morning. Think about common ground. This argument is made particularly in the realm of apologetics. Apologetics sounds like making an apology. It just means giving an answer to skeptics, to those who don't believe. It's a, a field of theology to think about how do we compare a biblical worldview with unbiblical worldviews? How do we tear down the strongholds of ideas and have people surrender their thoughts to the way Christ thinks? And there are a number of different schools of apologetics. Some would say you need to prove to people that the Bible is true by evidences and authorities outside the Bible so that they will read the Bible so that when reading it, they will believe it so they will come to the gospel. I take a different view of that. I believe that when people see the truth, they suppress the truth in unrighteousness because their deeds are evil, John 3, 19 to 21 and Romans chapter 1. And the gospel itself is the power to overcome unbelief. I'll never forget hearing the testimony of a man who in his college days was having difficulty with Jonah and a fish. You're telling me that ah, I can't believe that. Despite the rumors of the Japanese man in 1974 who was swallowed by a whale shark and spit up three days later, I don't know whether that is true. I don't know that that makes good evidence that then compels you to believe the biblical account. This guy didn't buy it. But then hearing the gospel, he saw his own sin and his need of a savior and that Jesus Christ is the only savior. And his college roommate asked him afterwards, yeah, but what about Jonah and the fish? And his response was, if God can forgive my sin... He can put a dude in a fish if he wants to. And so when we think about apologetics, sometimes we're tempted to think, I need common ground with the unbeliever. If I can lay a framework, a foundation, where we can both stand on the same platform and then have a reasonable, rational dialogue about Christ, then I can convince them to believe, and they will. And I will just tell you, this dividing line between believers and unbelievers makes common ground in that regard not possible. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 
Look, we don't, we don't look at people through the lens of the flesh, through outward experiences, through, through natural lenses anymore. We, we, we've learned anthropology coming to the gospel. In other words, we, we've learned what man is. At enmity with his God, spiritually unable to re- resurrect himself from spiritual death. And as we read in 1 Corinthians 2.14... The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness to him, and he, listen closely, cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. And and verse 14 makes it clear that natural man is unable to acquiesce to spiritual things. Until the Spirit of God makes him a spiritual man, he will not, cannot understand spiritual things. And you know this about your own testimony, Christian. One day you thought Jesus was boring. The next day you thought he's everything. One day you trusted in yourself and the next day you knew, oh, I got nothing. I need Christ. One day you thought you were a good guy. And the next day you thought you were the chief of sinners and you need a savior. Who flipped that switch? God did. And notice verse 15 of 1 Corinthians 2. But the one who is spiritual, that's contrast to the natural in verse 14. In other words, now the Christian, what does the Christian do? Appraises all things. What does that mean? If you're a Christian here this morning, you You know what it was like to be an unbeliever. And you know what it's like on the other side of belief. You know both worlds. And some of you are going, yeah, but I got saved when I was like four and a half. I don't remember what it was like to be a dirty, rotten sinner living out the excesses and the dissipations of my lusts. I will tell you this, Christian, you you, you have the residue of that total depravity. And if you're anything like me, I think about my own life even now, and I think, oh, I see enough pollution to know what I would be apart from Christ. I think I know where I would end up. I think I know what I would pursue. I think I know the emptinesses that I would go after, the futilities and the self-destruction. And so the Christian who's been a Christian a long time, I can't quite remember what it was like to think as an unbeliever. Uh, you've got the residue of unbelief in your heart in a mixed condition. <laughs> you can tap that. And for those of you who came to Christ later in life, you can think about what it was like to be natural, merely natural. And you know the contrast. You know the before and after. A Christian understands both worlds. Been there, done that. And so any blood-bought believer, forgiven, reconciled to God, adopted, beloved, is a herald of transforming grace. You don't need common ground with the unbeliever. You just stand on the rock-solid bedrock of Christ and you tell the world what he has done, indiscriminately preaching the good news to anything that moves, and you watch whom God makes alive, just as he made you alive when someone else boldly opened their mouth. That's our task. We're coming to that in the coming weeks. Our message, that's the end of this chapter. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for new creaturehood. We couldn't produce this. We couldn't bring this about. We couldn't make ourselves right before you. We could not do the renovation that the gospel does. And that's as you would have it. So that no man may boast. So that truly from you and through you and to you would be all things. And so we had cry out to you, even this morning, to you be the glory. We praise your grace. As trophies of your grace and heralds of your grace, we also revel in your grace. In Jesus' name.